I'm Mocha Only, and you're checking out Breaking Records Radio. Don't forget that, because if you do, you're a dummy. Yeah, I, like I got in. I got into uh, not matching, but rather using uh, like colors off of each other, like complementary colors. Yeah, yeah. And it, it opened up a whole new world of possibilities. Yeah, you do a good job at it too. Yeah, it's fun, man. It's fun. I learned the color wheel, man. So as long as I go by that, then I can't really make any mistakes. Yeah, yeah. I feel, I feel like that's my next step, you know, because I, I honestly sometimes I'll throw an outfit on that I've had for a while and I'll like put it on and be like, I kind of like, I kind of look like a character when everything matches too much. You know what I mean? It's like, it's almost a little too much. That might be good though. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the most important thing is how it makes you feel, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No matter I what type of style you're wearing, if you're happy and you're wearing it with intent, then you know you've done the right thing. Yeah, exactly. 100%. Yeah. And you're, you've, no always been, you've always been a man of style, though. Like, your well, whole I, don't know. I, I kind of fell off for a while. I was kind of going back to, like, I don't know, like this hash skater look or whatever. And I enjoyed that. But one day I just had this feeling like it wasn't really me. Like, yeah, like at my age, you know what I mean? Like, I'm 50 now, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, it just started feeling like I was pretending yeah which i was which i was to a degree because we all have a uniform right like it every every whatever style you dress in some little sense is kind of like cosplay no matter what yeah 100 percent. yeah so yep. me i'm today i'm doing my miles davis cosplay <laughs> <laughs> yeah taking it back to the jazz roots yeah always man i i like I'm a well, I'm a huge Miles Davis fan, but not just his music, but his outlook on life, his painting, his artwork, and his style, his sense of style, which changed from decade to decade. But in the late 50s and early 60s, he found Ivy style from like the Northeast colleges. And he was one of the guys that really pushed that and expanded it into the world beyond colleges and popularized it. And I figured that's that's I did some studying and that seemed to be the style that, that matches me the best because it's like the most casual version of dressing up. It's it's like the college kids of the 50s wanted to rebel against their dad or their grandpa. So rather than wearing a suit, they just wear a button down collar Oxford shirt and and rather than dress shoes, they wanted to wear something casual. So they wore loafers and, you know, it was, that's basically, it was like teen rebellion, but for really? some reason it's stuck. And now adults to this day adhere to this style, which is really like college cosplay. It's kind of funny. That's crazy. eh? Yeah. I never really and, had any. And, and basically anywhere you look around and yourself included is the evolution of Ivy style. Yeah. It's the modern iteration of it, because if Ivy hadn't happened, there's a good chance we'd all be in suits and jackets every day. Wow, that's crazy, eh? And yeah. what was that? That was the late 50s, early 60s? Yeah, mid-50s, mid, mid 50s, people first started, like, it became a thing in the colleges. And then it really, by the mid-60s, it had spread. And then, you know, the flower power generation kind of tore that down. And then from that point, it was kind of like anything goes, the psychedelic era, 70s people kind of got back into it in the 80s but then it was laden with like this prep style yeah which was an offshoot of ivy it's it's convoluted and long but i've for some reason i've always found style very interesting to me it feels like an extra arm of the arts like yep when you dress it's almost like you're like a painting yeah it's like yeah expressive to the world like this is the mood that i'm in and for me as a musician man I, I i want i want to i want to express that whether i'm just looking at myself staying in all day or if i want to convey something to a wider audience meaning you know going to the groceries or whatever yeah yeah well, and it's even to what you said too it's like it is kind of it is kind of like a caution because even in, in the in the sense of like connecting it to the art it's like for one it's like Anytime I do a music video, I always make sure I'm wearing it. Like I have an outfit that I haven't worn in another video. You know what I mean? It's like of you want course. to. Of course. Yeah. That will never stop, man. 
that yeah. will never stop. But it's like I did so much digging in, in, into the the evolution of of classic Ivy style and where it led to. And interestingly enough, late eighties, mid mid eighties, actually all through the eighties in hip hop and into the nineties, we were dressing Ivy style and not even knowing it. But it was a much more street version of it. And yeah, I'm like, talking about I'm talking about NWA. NWA came out. They're wearing chore coats and and often uh khakis khakis was like the main anchor of ivy style all through the 50s yeah i guess it's crazy when you see it even like the, the sweatshirts hoodies all that stuff it all has its roots in in ivy and it's very interesting and i don't know why the hell we're talking about this <laughs> But it's interesting, though. It's interesting. It is interesting. Well, yeah, because, I mean, I would rather talk to you about just whatever's on the mind and because everything relates back into the music, you know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. And that's it, even with you saying it, it's interesting because, you know, as much as style is a part of this culture, and I think it's one of the things that a lot of us, especially us creative types, are enamored by it's part of the it's part of the complete package of what makes you fall in love with the artist you fall in love with and it sure and, is. and um i think surprisingly enough though it's a part of the kind of the culture and everything that doesn't like even just you explaining the ivy style like i've never really researched style a whole lot you know like i didn't either until like the past 10 years it snuck yeah. up on me and became an interesting thing you know i had started thinking like well why do we dress the way we do? Just meaning, you know, the general public, like what, where does roots come from and what do certain pieces of clothing, like what is the etymology of them and what do they symbolize? And it was astonishing to find out just how much of our current everyday wear has like military roots or British roots or Indian roots. Interesting. You know? Yeah, I just I did such a deep dive and just being like the weird autistic dude I am. It's like when I zero in on something, I'm I'm interesting and I'm I'm just I'm interested in it. I, I get lost in it. I, I want to know every detail. Yeah. Yeah. That's very yeah. interesting. I actually I get after this interview, I'll probably end up researching some, <laughs> into some style. It's, That's it's a, been it's been fascinating, man. It, it really has. And you know, I'm I know to um, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but to an uneducated public, if they they knew me from a certain style and they see how I dress now, they they might mistakenly think that I, I'm trying to be better than them, or or that it's like a stuffy white style. It's not the case. It's not the case. Like I say, like through people like Miles Davis and the jazz movement, black people really did a huge lion share of populating. Uh, of, of popularizing Ivy style as we know it. Yeah. Uh, it, it has roots. It has deep roots, both in the white and black community and just American culture as a whole. It's re really interesting. And then when you bring Japan into it, that's a whole nother bag of worms because Japan's probably done the best job of being able to preserve classic Ivy style as we know it and yeah. sell it back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, even through we're... even through like artistic designers like Nigo, like it's this is it's such a, a convoluted long conversation, but it's just another rabbit hole that you could choose to go down, especially anybody that's invested in hip hop. And as you mentioned prior, style is such a huge element of hip hop and people will probably have their socks knocked off when they realize the correlation between classic or modern hip-hop style and its roots from ivy style yeah and crazy right yeah and it's interesting too like the idea of you even mentioning like how prominent miles davis was in kind of pushing this through and and the jazz movement because it's like once again it's like hip-hop is just kind of a it's a remix of everything great from the past you know that's the beautiful absolutely it's it's um i go as far as this call well, I forget who it was in jazz that it said it. It, it might have been Miles or it might have been Wayne Shorter, but somebody at one point had challenged an interviewer when they categorized them as jazz. They said, no, this is American classical. 
mm. modern myth, classical. And I'm like, wow, well, if that's the case, then hip hop being a new form is essentially the same. It's American yeah. classical. Yeah, that's yeah. that's yeah. neoclassical American. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's just it's it's just the greatest thing. I feel like hip hop has a life force of its own. Like it's 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 like a spiritual entity, like a god, if you will. Yeah. Through the energy that we give it and the allowances we 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 make to have it continue with the passion that we do it's it's mind-blowing and that leads me into you know this whole celebration of the 50th anniversary of hip-hop which at first i'm like chuck d don't believe the hype and here we go talking about chuck d again yeah but i think that's always going to be a common theme but everything goes back to chuck right yep. so i i didn't want to get wrapped up in the whole hype of it but it was so infectious and endearing I, I couldn't help it and i i just really realized the significance of it this year especially with me like you know my 50th birthday which i'm is coming up in november it's uh, i'm not quite 50 yet but what what are the odds right yeah that's a, that's an interesting point too right and i and i know obviously there's different conversations and arguments to be made about if it's really the 50 but i mean realistically i think you know and not that we have to go down that rabbit hole anyways, but I truly believe it is. I think I think Herc's parties was really the first place where not it, it wasn't the first of anything, but it was the first where you were allowed a space to to be one of all of elements. You know what I mean? Exactly. The disco and, club yeah, couldn't let boy in I don't, there. I don't even see like I plead a little bit of ignorance. I try to do my history, but I don't know if you know the 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 birth year of hip hop, nineteen seventy three. I don't believe Kaz was really rapping yet. Yeah, no, he was DJing still, I believe. Kaz? Thing. No, not yeah. Kaz, just cats in general. Oh, yeah. 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 But I, I'm I'm just I'm just saying, like, you know, it took a while for the elements to adhere together, right? Yeah. But yeah, what a wonderful thing, man. What what a world. Imagine a world without hip hop music. That's like trying to imagine a world without jazz. Yeah. Hip -hop. To a world without style imagine a world where we all just wore suits yeah yeah i mean well, <laughs> it might not be so terrible i mean they had their place you, you know what i mean i don't personally wear suits i will wear a sport coat and tie and then people sometimes think that's a suit but it's not yeah that's kinda, um, that's kinda i feel hot. like whatever whatever i throw on even if i am wearing neck wear it's I, i'm still I'm still conveying hip hop, no matter what. I mean, you can put me in a cowboy hat, like with fucking blonde pigtail wig. I'll still be representing hip hop. Yeah, it's gonna yep. come through somehow. You know what I'm saying? God yeah. forbid we ever see that, but I'm just saying. I mean that that's not too far off from what Mel was wearing in the message. <laughs> you got a very good point. You got a very good point. The flamboyancy of early hip hop. I mean, yeah, but it was so new and experimental, and theatrical so why not right yep. look at look i mean look at africa bambada like same same thing like that was some wild it almost felt like he was a continuation of like parliament funkadelic you know what yep. I mean? trying to find his own his own piece of that right yep it's all too interesting man i love it all and it's an, and it's pretty uh it's pretty crazy to think that you know you were hip hop's turned 50 this year and you're turning 50 this year like you've been there you've been there for the whole ride whether well a lot a lot of it a lot of it i mean whether intuitively or not right like at a certain point like you know like you guys that that's 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 actually very interesting i i i'm fortunate that i got onto it early i mean i was like a kid you know what i mean but i found it early you know by the 1983 or so you know i was aware of it and it it was drawing me in slowly but surely and then i started rapping it was 1987 i guess so yeah like i've been hip-hop longer than i haven't you know what i mean and that's wild to think that like it really it's shaped me it's it's wild and that and you you were in victoria at the time right correct i spent my childhood in victoria Going to a, a private school too, 
And if they hadn't, I, you know, I was really reluctant to enter into this private um, elementary school. But if it hadn't been for that, I might not have found hip hop in the way that I, I did. I might, really? It might have came later or something, you know what I mean? Um, because there was kids who were older than me at that school that were very interested in hip hop. And, you know, they had the cardboard out at recess the boom box and all that and it was just wow to me and this is you know i had seen beat street and it was just i was like i need a piece of that i have to have i have to i just have to i was like pop music is cool rock music is cool but this rap stuff that that's beckoning me and so and it's crazy to think too because like even here in toronto right uh you talk to a lot of the people who are kind of early on embarking on the hip hop scene here. And a very common thing was that every Tuesday they would pile up in the car and go drive over the border to New York to get the new records. Right. Because this predating internet and stuff. Right. We so do that here too. Yeah. And that's what I was wondering. Cause uh, I actually, I was just on Vic um, Vancouver Island for my first time last month. So I actually have a little bit of a, context of you know the distance it is to get to the mainland and everything else like for hip hop to should have hollered next time you end up out there man give me a shout you know what I, mean? I will I will for sure I was in Nanaimo yeah. my brother lives there love it Nanaimo is crazy because it's like this time capsule man I haven't performed in Nanaimo for a few years but the last couple of times I went I'm like holy cow man the crowds were still coming out and like this hip-hop essence it just reeked of hip-hop there and it was wild to me like where as victoria didn't even feel like that a few years ago it had like fallen off even vancouver like don't even get me started but really i do feel, I do feel it's all coming back yeah yeah i've heard that valve uh, yeah my brother was saying that victoria is like uh gentrified and gone crazy as far as like uh growth in the last few years because he used to live there yeah, yeah, it's definitely expanded, man. But yeah, so you, I mean, you got a taste of it. Like, Nanaimo's definitely, well, I guess once you get on that ferry boat, it's pretty much the same distance as Victoria. Yeah. But Victoria was a, a larger city, has a whole different feel to it. It's kind of like a, Victoria's like a scaled down Seattle. It's, it's yep. identical to Seattle in a lot of ways, where Nanaimo was. I almost can't compare it to anything. It's got its own feel to it and almost like a maritime feel too. It does almost. Yeah, maritime feel but with the mountains around and uh, um Now Nanaimo yeah, it, was Nanaimo was a coal town. That was one of their original industries that helped shape the city as we know it today. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, it's beautiful out there, but like just to even you know, for you guys to be getting hip hop in 83, like what was it like? And because you were young. So, I mean, how were you getting your hands on the music or was it just second hand? It was second hand through the school. It was like tapes that guys brought to school and whether they got them from older cousins or brothers, I'm not sure. There was a very small selection of hip hop available even by like 1985, 86, you know, so we're, we're talking like Run DMC plus, you know, um, you know, treacherous three, what, whatever the what was popping then, um, but it was it was minuscule. What you had to do is you had to get tapes from people, and that's exactly what I did. All my first rap stuff I ever got was hand me downs from kids at school, like dubbed, 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 hissy. <laughs> yeah, until there was a store called Lyle's Place in Victoria, and. They were like yeah, cool hip indie record shop, like think uh that high fidelity movie, you know, same sort of vibe. They started really getting the potent stuff. Yep. So, you know, especially by like 1988, it was like on and popping, you know what I mean? I mean, I remember in 1990, that's where I bought uh People's Instinctive Travels in the Path of a Rhythm from. Like I knew that was coming out and I got it right when it came out in April, you know. Um, so yeah, Victoria caught up eventually, but yeah, it was, it's not like we grew up, it's, it's not like we even grew up on Long Island. Long Island probably had its, its similar challenges in the mid to late eighties too, as far as, as proximity to hip hop culture, even though they are within the realm of New York city, you know what I mean? Limits. 
but that's you know it it was groups from long island whether public enemy epmd de la soul kmd whatever stetsasonic that made me feel like it could be legitimate to be from vancouver island and do hip-hop yeah it's funny, like I, re- you know, when you're young, like you do reach for validation from outside sources, and, and, and of course, being from the outskirts of Victoria, like it didn't seem like a hip hop place, but after we messed with it, it started really feeling like a hip hop place, you know. And yeah. when you start to draw the parallels with, with, with you know these towns in Long Island and the groups that came from there. Me and Prevail, we thought, well, why the hell not? Why can't this be a legitimate place to be from? So we willed it into being, just like anybody, whether you say you're from Windsor, Ontario, or Guelph, or whatever, you know? Eventually, the time comes where you can put your own stamp as an artist, as a hip-hop artist, on your own city. And this is something I've always been very diligent about doing in my own music. You know, you always hear these obscure places in vancouver that i like to put in in my raps and stuff because i'm proud of it and i want people to feel a sense of 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 the community and the space that we live in i don't want to be the guy that has all these rap skills but you you have no sense of who they are or where they came from you know what i mean uh this is this is if i had any advice to give a younger hip-hop MC generation coming up. That's like one of the most important things. Like tell your story yeah. down to your local haunts and your friends and your people and, and your own coded names. Cause we all, you know, our coded language, we all end up with that. De La was like the most shining example of that. I don't know what the fuck they were talking about <laughs> on the first album. That's what was so intriguing about it, you know? Yeah. And, and gave us allowances to create some of our own local dialect too, you know? Yeah. What a thing, this hip hop thing. Yeah, it's beautiful, man. And that and that's interesting. So you and Prev really kind of started together like right from the beginning. Like almost got- almost almost the beginning. At first, I was with my homeboy Dubnut, Rennie Foster. He inducted me into his pre existing rap group that was called Sound Advice. It was yep. Victoria like Victoria's premier rap group. I was thrilled as peaches to be asked to get into this, you know, cause I knew he rapped and we had started to get closer and stuff and share our love for hip hop. And he invited me into his group along with another MC degree one, who is still the premier like DJ in Victoria, hip hop DJ that brings in acts to this day. And our okay. DJ was DJ T double. Now, Prev was on the periphery, and I was interested to see his development as a young MC. And we just started clicking real hard. So, you know, I I asked the guys in Sound Advice, it's like, can I do the side project with, with Prev? And, you know, it was a little bit salty. So they're like, well, you just go do your own thing. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? A little bit of salt at first. But they they saw they saw what it meant to us, and it was accepted pretty well. So I credit mostly my homeboy, Rennie Foster for um, really giving me that boost of confidence. You know what I mean? And he was a ripper of an MC. Currently he's still in music. He does house music and techno music, but from a hip hop perspective. And when you're talking about hip uh, techno music, that's very valid. Techno is from Detroit and was the hood music of its time of of birth and often created by guys who had one foot in hip hop and one foot in the electronic world. And same thing goes for house music too. And yeah. you, you, you'd even see that as, as proof in like groups like Jungle Brothers, which had Owl House, you, or even De La and other Native Tongue members flirted with house remixes and all that, or Boogie Down Productions. They had... Yeah. Um, um, you know the song "Love's Gonna Get You." Yep. Um, amongst others, was produced by Pal Joey, a guy named Pal Joey, who was already a well-established house producer. Who really? Also, who? Yeah, from New York, who grew up hip hop and also did hip hop productions. So, I think. 
I think Love's Gonna Get You might have the the dopest low end in it out of any beat of its era. Yeah, man. That's one of my favorite all-time hip-hop beats for its subtlety and its jazz. I believe yeah. that I believe that is a not not John Schofield, who was another guitarist of similar caliber at that time. I know it wasn't John Scott, Pat Metheny. I believe it's a Pat Metheny sample. Really? Yeah. And which was wild because when they used it, the song they sampled from was just from the prior year. You didn't see a lot of that in hip hop at the time with the exception of maybe Brand Nubian sampling yeah. Edie, Brickell, Edie Brickell for a slow down, right? Yeah. But anyway, going back to what I'm saying is like how this relates to my boy Rennie being uh, cemented in in house and and techno it was similar to this cat pal joey and you know it's it's roots are side by side with hip-hop so you know i i've even dabbled in it myself and when you understand the etymology of it, it you can feel the same energy as hip-hop in house yeah. music um even right down to the fact that it's as groove oriented music and a lot of it's sample based. Yep, exactly. And that's what I was going to say. Like a lot of even the techno kind of in the era, I guess, because, you know, I grew up in the much music era, right? So I grew up in a different era. So the same era where I was seeing you guys on TV, you know, um, would be the same era where I'm getting introduced to, I guess, whatever the popular quote unquote techno jungle music of that time was, but like your fat boy slims and your, you know, prodigy and, um, you That's know, definitely an extension because, you know, they, they sort of created their own tilt with it and yeah. it's so the commercial success was in my opinion, surprising. Yeah. Or then yeah. you've got, you know, groups swipe hard from it, even like a group like Aqua you know what I mean? If it wasn't for the original techno and house or even hip hop, would those groups have had that type of success? Those solo artists, um, like Moby or whatever. Moby, you know? yeah. Even yeah. back, back to very, like, even though he's not the house direction, it's that same type of format, you know, it's sample based music, just with a different style, stylism to it. even Fiona Apple had, you know, like, I mean, you can go as far back as Alanis Morissette's debut album. There's drum breaks on there. Oh, absolutely. Because she was kind of more on that, um, just almost like like the Lisa Stansfield kind of kind of thing. Yeah. And now, you know, Alanis is married to an underground rapper from from California. Like it's wild, man. She was she was spotted hanging out with like living legends at the recent Hyro Day. Really? Yeah. Crazy full circle man it's wild right That's yeah she, she's married to a, a underground rapper named soul eye okay yeah that's crazy shout, i don't know shout out shout out to soul eye and shout out to alanis too that's insane but yeah it's yeah. like roots that hip-hop it's funny because you know when you get into it at least in my generation right you you got to see it more from its inception and when it was something fresh and to me it was something fresh because the music I grew up around hearing my parents play and stuff was not that. So when I discovered it, it was this kind of new thing to a degree. But um, as I've gotten older and restudied music and, you know, and, and you go back and you look, you you see its influence and roots in a lot of the stuff that my generation grew up on the whole 90s, you know, from it, it it's its foundations bled into damn near everything. Hell yes, man. I mean, well, you were you were still there, like close to his infancy, basically. You know, you you not like I I don't have that many more years on you in in the hip hop. I mean, let's face facts. When I first started rapping, it's like I was still. It's not like I was in the hotbed of hip hop and surrounded by it. It was just like a handful of us, literally. You know what I mean? I wish you know. I, and I'm not one to exaggerate. I don't want to exaggerate and be like, yeah, I was actually there in like 83 doing it. No, I, w I became aware of it. Yeah. In 83, I don't know how old I was, what, like nine years old or, or something like that. But God, you know how, you know how that was when you first 
heard your first taste of rap music and you're like, what is that? Yeah. Oh my God, what is that? Let me get a little taste of that. How can I be down, basically? Yeah. 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 And it's always its own interesting kind of just um everything about it. Like my earliest rap memory is going to my brother's room the one who lives in Nanaimo, but he's 12 years older than me. So going into his room when he wasn't home, because God forbid he caught me in his room looking at his CDs. And looking at his tapes and CDs. Oh, my God, that could be a little, that could more than a noogie. That's for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. And just, like, the different stuff you'd see. Like, you're like, what the hell is a super duper fly? Like, what is a Miss E missed? Up? What does this say? The Quranic? Kr- what, what is that? What is a Dr. Dre? What it, you know, what is this cartoon dog with the, you know, the, the, <laughs> a Snoop, right? Yeah. This looks a lot different than the Burton Cummings greatest hits of my dad's CDs collection. You know what I mean? It's like, what? right. It, yeah. But I mean, props to that stuff too, man. It's funny because, and this is a little deviation from what, what we're talking about, but, you know, through sampling and and wanting to research where our music first originated for before it became rebirthed into hip hop. Like we, all of a sudden you, you one day you find yourself really understanding a Burton Cummings and where, you know, like his contribution to music or, um, you know, Linda Ronstadt or, 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 you know, or any of our like Canadian pop heroes or whatever. Like it's wild though. Those, you start hearing that stuff with a, a different ear and that's thanks to what we've learned as far as research in hip hop, right? You can yeah. grow to appreciate the things that you thought were the biggest turnoff to you when you were a kid, you know? Yep. 100%. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like I love Ann Murray. Yeah. I, I think she's like one of God's gifts to music. Uh, I actually listened to Ann Murray, you know, even 10 years ago, like that might've been a giggle to talk about. But now, you know, I watched her recent documentary called Full Circle. I'm like, oh man, Ann Murray really is the truth. That's wild, you know? And I can say that with, with, with no, there's no irony in me saying that and no shame in it too it's like you you get you know you get you get older in this hip-hop thing and and you besides maintaining your rap skills dj skills production skills we don't have to prove our hipness anymore yeah Yeah. you know what i'm saying yeah yeah it's it's cool when when you when you get to that point and you're able to drop the pretense and you can just be who you are. That's how freaking liberating is that? Yeah, it's it, and it truly is. And I think that's something that maybe some artists maybe to a degree don't understand. And like, and that I'm not somebody who hates on what's going on now or the new thing. I, you know, I can look at something and say this is for me, this is not for me. But I think. One thing that I'm so glad that I don't have to be a part of is this rat race of trying to keep up with the Joneses of trends. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I, man. I, I'll walk around a bandana with a matching sweater and a pair of Converse on. If I, look I like love a, it, I love it. You keep doing that, great. man. Like I said, make you feel good. You keep that going. I don't want to see it any other way, man. Exactly. Unless, unless all of a sudden you want to do it another way. Yeah, keep it going, man. Yeah. It, it is. The, it is. The, speaking of, you know, the bandana, like for the most part, was really like a rebellion to Ivy style in the 60s. Really? Yeah. Interesting. So even the bandana has its roots attached to Ivy style. That's wild, right? Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. That's but crazy. yeah, going on what you're saying, like it's, it's, it's wild, man, with what the, the youth hip hop market is doing, like with the trap and the drill. Um, I want to be open minded about it. And some of it, yeah, some of it's catchy. Yeah. But the hip hop culture, it doesn't seem to be involved in that. They don't seem to, I'm speaking generally, of course, but the average 20 year old who's a rapper in, in, in trap and doing the, uh, the robot voice, <laughs> you know, the, the, the auto tune, whatever. I don't think they really, most of them don't couldn't give a flying fig newton about hip hop yeah it's like a different thing i almost wish it really could be its 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 own thing but at the same time these kids are young they will grow older 
and perhaps start to embrace the true roots of it. Let's be honest. We were doing trap music in the 90s, too. Yeah. There's no, nothing new about trap music. It's just become, it's oh. become whittled Benefit. down something that's a little more of its very own thing. But here's another thing, man. The keeping up with the Joneses thing you mentioned. How would it look if Mocha Only just suddenly started putting out albums that were all trap, trying to reach that younger audience? That younger audience doesn't want that. No. They want a 50-year-old guy trying to keep up with them. That's like creepy and kooky to them. Yeah. So for all you MCs that, you know, are I think it's good to experiment. And if you, you enjoy the trap sound by all means, but if you feel that you are forced to change your identity, you should give it some second thought for real. Because yeah. if you're doing that to try to attract younger ears. 98 percent of the time i swear that's not gonna work you're not they've got their own thing so let them have their own thing yep you know yep. you want to taste I, i've rapped on trap stuff because some people you know they hire me to do songs or whatever and it might be a younger artist and i'm like oh when that happens i'm mega surprised i'm like wow for i can't even believe you listen to my stuff enough that you'd want to have me on your trap song so i will gladly do it and i can do the trap cadences that ain't yep. nothing to me I can do it. It's to me, it's actually kind of cool because a lot of those cadences is like on some jazz type shit, you know? Yeah, it's that just, it's oh. just it's just a lot of those beats sort of depress me at the same time. But yeah. you gotta think about what it is. It's teenage nihilism, the same thing that we had, you know, with punk rock. Yep. It's very similar, man. It it's is very, actually put it like that. I never really drew the correlation between the two but you're right it, it actually very it kind of is very reminiscent of early punk rock where it's like it's not really so much about the talent but the 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 the, the feeling yeah and the whole i don't give a fuck yeah which you know that should have limitations and it will i'm frugal man i'll admit it I, you know what i'm saying and, you know, in a game like the hip hop music where like if you're great, you could stand to make hundreds of dollars. It's like you got to be a little frugal sometimes. Yep. Yep. I always, uh, joke, I always joke with people about that. I'm like, man, hip hop is great. Like if you're really good and you play your cards right, you could stand to make hundreds of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you can use that. You pass that one on, man. This shit is mad funny to me. No, that's that's a good one though. That's a, that might even be a good sound bite for the interview. To be honest, that's a that's a good one right there. There's a sad ankle of truth about that. Thanks to streaming. And the funny thing is, is that a lot of people get into this thing, um, a little um enamored by the image that's put off by you know the mainstream, I guess, quote say or the or the industry that um you know, and people think that they're gonna come into this thing and make tons of money and it's like you know yeah. this, you it gotta ain't happening it ain't happening oh, you, you gotta, gotta uh you can make it happen but you gotta like it has to be your life and like your everyday pursuit you know what i'm saying so, yeah none of us is rich man but we love this thing we love it and that's the important part you know and uh and even like say that too you know to start rapping in the 80s I, I want to take it a little bit back to the thing with you and Prev, because I've heard you talk about before, like, you know, you guys walking home the one day. Um, doing yeah. The and and um, we, we, yeah, we ran out of rap, so we just went freestyle because I'd always done a little bit of freestyle because I thought that's just what every rapper did. Yeah. And that became shocked to, shocked to find out later that that wasn't the case. And then you guys ended up kind of becoming known on the, As the freestyle guys yeah, yeah. and in, in vancouver we were like the freestyle guys hey look it's the crazy freestyle guys it's split sphere the crazy freestyle duo yeah <laughs> and that's crazy and I, I you had mentioned like you know getting battles and how some other mcs that were in the scene at the time almost would like i don't know if throw shade at use the right word but weren't yeah we definitely definitely absolutely yeah. Because you guys could on the spot do your thing and they could not. I don't know if it was so much that they could. 
I don't know if it was any envy about that at all. I just, I think it was just young egos. Um, I don't know. I guess it probably had something to do with that. Who, who knows? But, you know, we were trying to be the best. We, we yeah. could. So that's, that's every part of it, right? And yeah. we'll, rip, we'll rip you a new one off the top of the head. You know, that's what we'll do. And in those days, too, like, because I'm sure, you know, that those are the days when you had to battle, really, to show and prove, right? Like, that was really one of the ways you got. Because even in my entry to hip-hop, that was still kind of where it was at. Before the internet really hit, it was like, that's how you got well, your name. Battle was the first option, and the second was the fist fight. <laughs> and a lot of these battles, you know, some of these battles – turned into fist fights so yeah you know and that that's like what kind of i mean i was never like i wasn't like a good fighter i had to do it though sometimes and you know i've won fights and i've got my ass fucking whooped before you know what i'm saying so we'd rather keep it on some rap lyric shit you know what i mean because nobody wants to it's like flip the coin and like lump up your fist or get lumped up yeah in front of people I'd rather lose a rap battle than lose teeth in front of people. You know what I'm saying? One hundred percent. Although the thing is, it's like, yes, but there's like a shot to like. I feel like, on a public perception, yes, I would rather lose a battle. But it's like when I have to go home at night and think about what happened, I'd almost rather go home with a couple bruises on my face than to have lost the battle. Yeah. Well, in hindsight, is. It's easier to say that, that's for sure man yeah i would say you know like 90 percent of the battles stayed peace you know what i mean and even when they didn't turn the scuffles it never it was always broken up by the crowd like oh what are you guys doing blah 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 yeah you know but yeah what a time man i mean uh, that it was fun i think prev was a little bit more into like he was more battle ready like he kind of looking almost to instigate battles and, and it was kind of like our mind state, though, is like, that's what we thought it thought it was. Like, if you're going to, like, try to be the best, then you may as well take on some challenge or, like, you know, initiate some of these things. Yeah. And do you, yeah. Like, and from those days, were there, um, like, were there any battles that you were a part of where, like, now moving forward, like some of these people have become all other notable figures in the Vancouver or the, you know, the British Columbia hip hop scene. Like were there, you know, oh, yeah, sure absolutely. Of- Rascals, DJ flip bat- out, flip out, mad child. Like, oh, oh. Yeah. Hell yeah. You guys battled these guys eh, early on. Like, yeah, Rascals. well, Preb, Preb instigated the one with the Rascals and I like, cause he's my boy begrudgingly. I had to get up on stage and, be there and enter into it too you know and meanwhile the rascals are like who the fuck are these fucking guys like what, what who are these who riders from victoria trying to like battle us at our own show at you know their show at their <laughs> show like looking back like i can say in one sense i'm glad it happened because it was character building over time and probably helped us gain a better understanding of each other in the long run. But it was just some young ego shit, you know what I'm saying? And it is what it is. That's just what we did. Or, you know, one time Prev had this scheduled battle at a nightclub with Flip Out and ended up losing to Flip Out, who wasn't known as, like, the crazy freestyle guy or whatever. But, you know, some things happened, you know, and it was – kind of wasn't our crowd at that that night and flip out ended up having the winning edge and you know there was we definitely walked out of there with some bruised egos but at the same time like flip out is one of my favorite people it's one of prevail's favorite people too we learned yeah. from we learned from that and it's a it's a it's a beautiful thing man uh props to flip out man one of the f- people in this this city who's just kept it going and become such a notable figure on an international stage through his work with like red bull academy and and all that and just an amazing dj and remixer like and and human amazing human yeah Yeah, your guys hip-hop scene over there you know it's um 
it's very rich and it's very i find it very interesting because i guess growing up so in such close proximity to toronto we're so privy to the history here and all the little nuances and the scene stuff but i was jealous um, of it but i'm jealous of like the you know people who got to grow up on the west and witness that because i feel like it was something that we're kind of almost a little ignorant to like our our inception to your guys' scene is really through like was it i guess rascals are really rascals was the first that really got on man me and Prevail were supposed to sign uh, a deal at Split Sphere with the same label that Rascals was had just signed, and we ended up not signing. Our our producer um, Judd at the time he had suggested against it, looking at the fine print. He knew more than we did for one reason or another. We didn't sign it, and I remember just I was kind of upset about that. I was like, I was willing to take it you know, maybe not the greatest contract in order to get our first shit out. So we had to wait for a while and watch the rascals like cemented that first glory, but they did a lot. They did so much for West coast hip hop for this, you know, I I don't like the term so much, but Canadian hip hop and just regional Vancouver hip hop on a world scale. Rascal did it. They did it big. They did it good. The music was solid. Yeah, the music was super solid, you know, like right. props to the Rascals for sure. Um, but aside from the Rascals, I felt very, you know, I felt a little bit envious of what Toronto had from such an early, early time that by the time 1996 rolled around, I was like, screw it. I'm just going to, I'm going to get a ticket and just fly out to Toronto. I only knew a couple people there and I just went. I just went like, let me throw myself into this and meet as many people as I can. I'm so glad yeah. I did that because I went out repeatedly through the mid to late nineties to try to, you know, foster relationships with some of these other MCs, DJs, producers, or, or, or whatever, you know, some of the first people I met was like Danny O, um, my guys from cryptic souls, planet P. You're going to Len and Cryptic Souls and stuff that flying out on those trips. Yeah, yeah. Len eventually, Len sort of adopted the whole Cryptic Souls thing and that ended up on their one of the Len albums that, you know, everybody yeah. seems to know or whatever. The Len shit was a trip in itself, but I'll get to that. I'll get to that. It's just like, you know, uh, who else I mean? Like Shaw Claire, yep. y- YOK around that time. Um, Oh, Corey D's, my man Corey D's, like the guys from the circle or um Monolith, you know what I mean? Like that the- that was that was great. Uh uh Chaos. So Thrust. I was super, super yeah. happy to to have like at least got my foot in a little bit in the nineties in the in the Toronto thing, you know. And that became a help too for you know when the swollen members thing, you know, really started kicking off in 2001. Right. I just, you know, we went to Toronto and I felt like home. Yeah. Yeah. And did, when you, when you're coming out to Toronto, too, just curious because he's someone that I feel like you guys would probably just shoot the shit for hours about hip hop, but thrust, you ever spend any time with thrust? Yo, check this out, man. Thrust was one of one of those guys I never had the opportunity to meet or do just didn't end up crossing paths. And I always wanted to, I always thought he was a solid MC. He just seemed like a cool dude. Like you could just read his mannerisms through his appearances in music videos, or interviews or whatever. So fast forward to now, Thrust and I are actually working on an album project together. Really? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, man, I was just on the horn with him the other day. Like, this is something we just decided recently because we just put out a single with uh, Navi the North as the producer. Yep. Um, yep. The song is called The Grand Gusto. Yeah. And Shout I out. asked Navi, I was like, Navi, like, you know Thrust, you're already doing stuff with him. Like, plug me in with Thrust. Thrust was super receptive about it, and we've been talking, and, yeah, we're just at the um, initial stage of of – deciding our our album direction and what we're going to do and it's going to be pretty interesting you know it's just be me and thrust rapping and i think navi and myself will split the production duties 
Incredible. I'm, so I'm this, excited. And this is just one piece of a, a bigger puzzle, not to minimize that, because this is huge to me. I'm, I'm so happy to be doing this thing with Rust and Navi, of course. But um, I'm just at a stage right now where, like, after only releasing like one album, like one proper Mocha album, like every two or three years for the last half decade or more, I want to be back to like being the West Coast most prolific. I, I want to do a bunch of stuff and I want to do a whole lot more collaborative things with other MCs and producers. I'm yeah. working on like four other projects right now that are produced by other people, which in my really? world, that's like a no no. Really? That's. It's interesting because yeah you always handled a lot of your production almost all of it 99 percent of it you know what i mean yeah. with like exceptions by like you know guys like this guy named like jay dilla or like whatever you know, you know little things like that sorry that was a stupid drop you know to do that um, well, see, the thing with the thrust connection is that he you guys both have that Detroit connection as well, too, right? Like, you and Illa J have a great working relationship. You worked with Dilla and, like, as well with Russ, you know, he's got the relationship with Frank and, uh, or sorry, Frank and with Frank and Dank. And, yeah. and those are my guys, too. Yeah. I got on with those guys early and we've, we've, yeah. I've had Frank on a couple of things. I've had Dank on a couple of things. I've yet to have Frank and Dank on. on so I got to make that happen. But actually yeah. just, yeah, I recently I'm on one of Dank's new albums that Navi had, had produced a track for or or, or that actually I think he did the whole album. I don't know. I got I got to do some catching up, man, because I'm so busy trying to create stuff. I'm missing some of the things my friends are putting out. Yeah. I love Frank and Dank, man. Yeah. I love those, them as artists and their history and um, and how they are as, as humans man those are like two of the nicest guys in hip-hop I've, I've ever had the pleasure to be around yeah dank dank is uh, yeah. I, I, I mean don't don't fuck around and find out you yeah. know on some dumb shit but like you know if you're a cool dude and like those are some of the coolest cats to be around yeah and you guys i, I I'm, I'm excited to hear what you and thrust to come up with because you guys even just in talking to you about hip-hop and then talking to him you guys kind of to a degree just your love and your passion of it from early on and the way that you're able to continue to hold that love and that passion to the current day it reminds me very much so i can only imagine like a fun conversation with you guys on the phone is probably just like the hey man i'll tell you man once we get this project underway or whatever we should we should get on we should do like a a one like a interview together or something shoot the shit you know what I mean? yeah I, I like, just, I feel, like I said, I never got a chance to know him before, and, and um, that always bugged me a little bit. I knew there'd become there would be an opportunity where it pre would present itself, and we'd finally start to start to do something. And I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I know. I'm excited to hear that too. And the joint you guys did with Navi is is really dope too. Navi's incredible. Navi is incredible, man. Yeah, I love his thieves. He, you know. I think it's easy enough to become a beat maker, but to become a beat maker and, and start to like cement your own sound. God, that that's a challenge, man. That's yeah. real. You know how people are so quick to, uh, in, in this game, like so quick to try to, uh, compare you to another, another producer, man. I used to get like, I'll admit, like, I've definitely borrowed heavily from the school of Q-Tip. Yeah. But I've always been very um, vocal about that. And, you know what I'm saying? People always try, but I do get tired of the comparison. I don't want to hear it from other people because I've already stated it. I don't yep. want the Dilla, the Dilla comparisons just because we use similar samples or whatever, or the feel is loose. I, I like to think that I can stand on my own two feet and I've got my own production sound and identity, you know what I mean? So it, yep. it's hard. It's hard to really, you know, on, on the production tip, like establish your own key sound points, which, which, which become your own identity, right? I almost feel that's harder for production than it is for rapping. I I would I would agree with you. I think so too. Because even as I mean, for rapping, you could choose your own voice. Even you know what I'm saying you could be on, like like be real. Yeah, and you could approach each song differently. Like you know, I got songs I might approach in a in an aggressive, almost like 
with a patois tinge to it. I got other songs just rap my normal voice. I got other rap, you know what I mean? Like you can influx your voice and do whatever matches to set the tone of what of you've written. Of course, man. You're you're at liberty to be any author you want. Yeah. You know, being a rapper is like being Superman. Yeah, it is kind of. You but can be, be and do anything you want to do. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Just remember, you know, to an extent, there's that old saying, live by the pen, die by the pen, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. But as but a yeah, producer, you... much more difficult to really harness in and create a sound that is yours. Like, Yeah. And just like rapping, when you start production, like inevitably you're, you're going to get your cues from those who came before you. In the same way that let's let's be honest, like Jay Dilla came from the school of Q Tip too, and you could yeah. totally hear that in his musical DNA for absolutely man. Yep, one hundred percent, and that's why the Uma just made so much sense for that to for that pairing to happen. It's like possibly one of the greatest production pairings that 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 could happen and has happened. Like, it was cool. It, the name the name was like mysterious, and yeah, you know, you're like who is the Uma exactly? Who is this JD? You know what I mean? Yeah. And then later, we you know when he like really put this whole uh, like offbeat swing and stuff that started happening like in the the later nineties or whatever. Like that was wild to me, man. Now I was already doing that. I got it from my homeboy DCO, who I still work with. DCO is a Vancouver area producer. And I'm working on some projects with him right now. He he's doing the production, but uh, I remember when I first met DCO in '97, and he showed me all his beats. I'm like, man, something something's a little jarring, but like in a cool way. And he explained he was using the Kurzweil 2000 sampler for one reason or another. He, did, I think you have to you have to turn on the quantize with that. And he just never did. I don't know what the exact case he how he explained it, but he just he didn't use a quantize. He just used his own feel, and some of the drums were a little off. I was like, "That's wild, man!" You know, and I kind of bit that a little bit. Yeah. And that was around the same time when I first also heard uh, "Tribe," the love movement. Yeah, yeah. Where it became very evident that this was an intentional production style yeah so between between dilla's influence and my friend dco mike's influence i was like this this feels like the way to go about it you can really you can really put like your own human idiosyncrasies into something that prior was so rigid you know what i mean yeah. other guys have tasted it before you know like uh I swear there's some some earlier tribe stuff where like I'm like, hmm, tribe called Quest, one two shit. That snare sounds a little early. Or or like some Pete Rock stuff, you know? Yeah. Um one hundred percent. You know, a guy like Dilla or D'Angelo. D'Angelo might have been the first word, you know, where where it was a noticeable um discrepancies in like the kick pattern or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't know. I think I heard like Quest Love talking about that at one point. I swear it might have been one of those one of those like Red Bull talk things or whatever. But yeah, so so influential, man. It's like that and that Dilla feel became like such a huge thing. I started hearing it in pop music, like in Brandy, produced by Dark Child, and like the strangest places, man. As it unfolded, and you hear it to this day. All these yep. guys that they call themselves. Um, lo-fi or whatever oh, I, I don't like that title or whatever I, but you know it's just another sub thing but it's like man that that dilla swing is all over it i i started to get to the point where i'm like i don't want none of that anymore because it's just it's just so popular right yeah so i still use i still don't use the quantize but i try to just make it more on than off for the most part unless i come up with a wonky feel on one particular song where i just know it warrants that but i still feel i've gotten to the point where i can do that and it shouldn't have such a dilla comparison yep you know what i mean i would i would agree too and i think like why well, and i think you have you know even to kind of harness back to really the opening of it you know and saying finding that production um 
identity is very difficult. But I would say you have definitely done it. I, when I hear a mocha beat, you know, it's like, this sounds like a mocha beat. And um, I also want to give a shout out to my man, too, Jack Hellington, who you produced. Uh, Hell yes. The uh, Sunny Side Up. And those beats. That was like, mad cool how that came out, man. He did justice to it. I was very happy with it. Yeah, he he did very. I was very happy with the way he put everything together, the branding of it, everything. He he did really well with that, and that was the first time he did a project. Like he kind of went on and because he was part of our team, so he kind of went on his own and did that and started doing his own thing with it. And it was like, yo, I really like the way that you you branded this, put it together, presented it. And luckily for me, I got the only feature on there with on the song with you. So, you know, that was uh that, that you know, big salute to Jack for that as well too. Hell but so, yeah. yeah, the beats on that like incredible. And um it, and it I I feel they very much fit in that pocket of what you're saying where you can hear that it's not quantized, but you've you hit it where it's not that it's not that noticeable diff you know, like that the J Dell where it's almost a little up um unsettling it, it's not yeah that, like let's but, face it you know what if you go back to dillard's discography like it wasn't all like that anyway not yeah. to what some of the, the younger kids nowadays that are making beats like they think they're doing a jay dilla tribute or impersonation or whatever and it's like yo he wasn't it wasn't in six eight time like it, it was in four four like it's not yeah. that long I almost kind of cringe when I hear a lot of that nowadays. Like, I'm, you know, unless the groove is just undeniable, then I'll give yeah. props. Because that's what yeah. it is. It's not, it's not about the, the tactic or the method to get there. It's about the groove. That's what it's about at the end of the day. You can't, you can't fake the funk, right? You can't falsify a groove. The groove has to be the groove. Yeah. And it's like yet the at the same time, on the other side of the coin, it's like that is just a notable school or method of production now, right? In the same way, like what Parliament Funkadelic kicked off. And all through the 80s, you had their heavy influence on pop music, soul music or whatever, right into hip hop music, EPMD and stuff, right? So, you know, it's going to continue to live. You're going to continue to hear that early snare for the indefinite future. You know what I mean? We, we yep. just have, we have to live with it. And sometimes it's going to be banging. Sometimes it's going to be very contrived feeling. And that's the nature of it, man. I'll say yep. this, man. I, I feel confident enough in my own production to where I've encountered other producers from different parts of the world where, it doesn't sound like Q-Tip. It doesn't sound like Jay Dilla or a mix of the two. I've encountered stuff that actually sounds exactly like my stuff. So yeah. uh, and, and I, I'm tickled by that. I'm not even unnerved or sour about it. I'm just like, wow, that that is so cool. I'm not like a big name in hip hop. So for anybody to feel it they could do like you know sort of pay homage or tribute to the little thing that i've created man that is so cool to me yeah it's incredible because i mean at the end of the day who did i just hear talking about this i think it was um it was in a said g interview and they were talking about the uh god i love said g yeah yeah same i do too and it's uh they're talking about the um i can't remember the name of the sample now um but it was the what ultimately ended up being Nick Knack Paddywhack by EPMD and ultimately ended up being um California Love. Um it's gonna drive me crazy. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I know the jam. Dun, yeah. dun, dun. And God, uh, now I can't think of it. And that's like common knowledge and it's just yeah. blown past my brain right now. Amble. Um ah, Oh, is gonna... it isn't that in like a substitution? It's substitution, yeah. I'm trying to think of the source tracks uh, name though. Um. Oh no. Um. No, not um. Not synthetic substitution. That's the Melvin Bliss break, right? No, oh, that's it, isn't it? Yeah, uh, that's ego tripping. But um, we're thinking of um. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I've ultra magnetic, man. 
yeah, either way. But yeah, he was talking about it and uh, he had got asked, like, you know, how do you how did you feel when like California Love came out? And it's just very similar sentiment to you. It's like, hey, man, you know, it's like it, it's a beautiful thing. Like you can't do anything but be proud because it just shows that, you know, that idea or that that, you know, that inkling you had once upon a time that, you know, I think I'm doing something right. I think this is dope. It goes to show that, you know other people picked up and agreed on agreed with you that it was dope and to see where somebody else can take it. It's, you know, those guys knew what they were doing, man. They, they knew that it was like paying homage to man. I mean, yeah. that track is so undeniable. Tupac is like a universe unto himself, you know, like, yeah. Dre. <laughs> what more can be said about them than it hasn't already. Right. Yeah, and actually, you know, and Dre's another one of those ones when we're talking about like Q Tip and uh and Jay Della having a, a a beautiful pairing. I think that's the one thing with Dre through his eras that really defines his career is the is the pairings of the producers he works with, right? Like, you know, yeah. era when you get him and Daz working together, you you create greatness like the chronic and doggy style. And then you get the Sam Sneed era Dre, where you get like um, natural born killers and keep their heads ringing and um, even you know the firm been there done that and uh, then you get like the Melman and Scott Storch era Dre where you get you know uh, or the high- late era Dre like with Chen and Jetty and like you know what I mean uh, yeah. DJ Khalil like awesome man yeah and that's you know it, it's it's the, the producers he chooses to surround himself with that you know really defines those eras of him being able to really just stay on top of the sound but they're they're, the the pairings that he picks it's just it's always impeccable like they're always they it's always extremely complimentary and it's like and needless to say that that's the traditional role of what a music producer is yeah a music producer might not even touch the instruments at all Yep. But they are the producer. They brought it forth. They picked all the right talent to make it happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, Eminem did that too with Bass Brothers, right? Yep. The Bass Brothers are actually incredible. They do not get the credit they deserve for how. Nah, you know what? As Swollen, we, we went to Detroit. We went to M Studio and we worked with the Bass Brothers too. Really? Um, yeah. All that stuff never ended up coming out, you know, politics and this and that and money and all that. But yeah, we were there. M was there too. No way. Mm-hmm. You guys are in the studio, the base, the the Bass Brothers studio with, with the Bass Brothers Brothers studio, Bass Brothers. Yeah, Bass Brothers. Bass. Now I forget what is a bass or bass, but you, yeah. those two guys. Anyway, yeah, we were there at the studio, like demoing some stuff. And I remember when we first showed up. They're like, "Oh, you guys just missed it. Slum Village was in here right before you guys arrived, or whatever." So, you know, a lot of people, I think, like in the Detroit area probably like tried to work with them or whatever the case was. But yeah, it was wild. Like to do the stuff with the Bass Brothers and the tracks sound like M and M tracks. You know what I mean? That's like spit, spitting in the booth, like spitting in the M and M's booth on his microphone. Like pretty wild, man. Like the same booth he would have recorded like joints like Rock Bottom on and like Yeah, so this is back in two thousand and two when this this took place, right? Wow. M was there, he was in the other room, he was doing business stuff or whatever, so we didn't get to kick it with him, but it was a cool experience. Wow, that's incredible. I had no idea you guys ever did that. And, the, and this not- is wild because right at that same time is when I connected with Dilla and Dilla sent me all these beat cds so i'm in there with the bass brothers and trying to do some stuff and my mind is on like, i need to get back to the bus so i can listen to these beat cds and choose what i want to use and like get back to dilla about that like that's where my head was at it was like on some complete detroit stuff <laughs> you yeah. know like i'm in the bass brothers the, the eminem studio like trying to do some recording and and i'm like my mind is on all these cds jd just sent me like in the in the mail back when everything was by mail, you know what I mean? Yeah, the self right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah the self destructing CDs, <laughs> man. Those things have further to deteriorated, by the way. Really, eh? They're even worse. They're, now. they're not even playable now. Yeah, like, it's like almost like they got like film like burn marks on them. It's the strangest <laughs> thing, man. Like they were coated with some 
coated with like some sort of residue that would render them useless over time. It's all right. You know, it's funny. I, 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 before those CDs got to that point, like, I, I would go through them again in later years. I'm like, wow, like so many of these beats have been used by everybody now, like Quali or Busta. Like, you know, and some of them were ones that I initially had chose. Like, I want this one. It was like going through like a Sears catalog, like when you're a kid. I was like, I got, I got, he sent me five CDs at first and then another couple like later. And I was just like, wow, I want this one. I want this one. I want this one. And talk to the record label, like you can't afford this one and this one and this one and this, that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up just doing one, you know what I mean? Oh, but that man. was cool. Whatever. You know, the, I, the reason I bring it up is because of that same era. And I guess maybe just me and me bringing this beat up, maybe that, it would be like, hey, that was on there. But um, one of my favorite Dilla beats is um, It Ain't Safe No More, the Busta Rhymes joint. Oh, my gosh. That one? Oh, that was, so that was on, was that on Genesis? It was on, um, it ain't, I think, isn't the album It Ain't Safe No More? Oh, God, you're right. It is. Yeah. That, was, that was after Genesis, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it was right after Genesis. Yeah, because Genesis had Breaking Neck and all that. Yeah, yeah, the album after Genesis with the, when Buster really started to go really mad with the baby, if you give it to, you know, that was on there and stuff. But that Dilla joint. Actually, song, now, now that song's mad nostalgic to me. I'm like, oh, man, I pine for the early 2000s now. Man. That was it. The early 2000s was, was such an aesthetic, man. Yeah. That was At a good the, time for the Def. That was a good time for the Def Squad, too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man! But yeah, God. going back back on that, like some of the like the Dilla beats that Busta would choose, like only Busta could choose those. Like they worked so well for him. How did he turn a beat like Genesis into such a crazy banging song? Like yeah. such a weird beat, man. It's such a strange beat. And and yeah. actually, that song was recorded in Vancouver at the place where I used to record at. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I and my my engineer and my engineer's assistant, who at the time was this girl named Christina, she was telling me she's like ah Buster was in here recently and uh and then he he asked me and so and so we to to get on the Genesis song and they added vocals to that she, pr production assistant like a the assistant engineer and she's she's on it she recorded it that's wild man. Is she like she like he asked them? To do yeah, there's like, a female oh, you guys are here. You guys are female. Can you go over this and say this? Because if there's, you listen to the original like, sample, it's as we're walking you off to the future. Yeah, yeah. we're going to get that, it right. That, that's them. That's like my production assistant, Christina, apparently. That's crazy. Wow. Right. In Vancouver. Yeah. That's fucking crazy. He was here at that time. In 2002, he was, I think he was filming a movie or something like that. He was in a mm -hmm. movie. And since almost everything's filmed in Vancouver, like all these, you know, a lot of guys would end up recording in Vancouver if they had a, a project they were currently working on. Yeah. Makes me wow. wonder how much, like, if, if there is much in the way, of, like, dog pound related stuff recorded in Vancouver, because those, those guys were always here. I used to run into them on like Robson Street and stuff, like Daz and Corrupt, like see them on the street corner or whatever, Snoop, whatever. Really, eh? Yeah, man. I oh. only regret like whenever I'd see them, it's like I, I should have just gone up and said what up, but I, just, I don't like to bug people if I don't know them, you know what I mean? Yeah. I know, yeah. It's, it's, there's There's been a lot of things in my past where I look back and I'm like, you probably should have, you know. I just, know, uh, man. One uh, Sometimes I did. I yep. ran into Tone Loke. I ran into Tone Loke on on Burrard Street once, and I just I went right up to him. I was like, "Peace, what up, Tone Loke?" He's like, "Yeah, what up, player?" One time I was on, again on Robson Street, on Robson and Howe Street. I saw Latifa on the other side of the street. I almost lost my shit. It just came out of me. I'm like, "What up, Latifa?" She turns around, "Hey." It was crazy. And then I I walked further up. I, I on the other side of the street. Up on Robson and Thurlow, I run into Prince Paul, her former no. producer. Like, what are the odds of that? That's crazy. 
he was talking to somebody else. I didn't stop and say what up to him, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, in five minutes time, Latifah's about to pass you and you're going to run into each other. Like, that's wild to me. I, you, I, I would almost just want to sit there and watch and wait for that moment to happen. You know I, I mean? should have. It was stupid of me not to. I would have loved to see that. It was right in front of a Starbucks which I frequently patronize, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I used to see all kind of rap luminaries. I see like Method Man, Walker. It's always Robson Street. Everybody wanted to be on Robson Street. Really, eh? That was the shopping, aka Cool District in Vancouver. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's still, it's still popping, but it's not. It's like a former shell of what it once was. Yeah, it's kind of what Young Street's become in Toronto too. It used, it used to be really cool. Now it's, I mean, it's still kind of cool but look retailers cannot afford to stay on robson street anymore when you yeah. see a tommy hill figure flagship store closed down or like j crew or whatever and you hear the murmurings that it had to do with the absorbent lease prices like i don't know it doesn't bode well for the future man yeah well, that's you know, you know you know vancouver is one of the most expensive cities to live in like it's crazy, man. It's like it's number two or number three in most expensive cities in the world. That's nuts to me, man. This used to be one of the cheapest places, man. I remember in the mid-90s, like, bro, I had one basement suite I shared with my homeboy, Che, and uh, we paid $200 a month for that. And it was a real basement suite. Like, it wasn't nothing. Like, it was pretty ghetto, but it was functional. <laughs> Two hundred dollars, man. This is nineteen ninety five or ninety six. Yeah, two hundred dollars, man. That's wow. Imagine that, eh? Imagine. You could rent. You could maybe rent a cardboard box for that price now. Like, hey, can <laughs> I use? Can I use a cardboard box at your house for storage? Yeah, cool. <laughs> It'd be two hundred dollars a month. Yeah, like you, li you literally couldn't even get like a shitty motel damn near for the night for two hundred bucks. A shitty wow. motel. You, 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 if you was trying to find a little one bedroom in this city for even 2000 Canadian dollars, like, good luck. Good luck trying to find that. That's insane. And Toronto's bad enough, but that's, that's, that's even, I think I that's... used to hear these nightmare stories about New York being like that. And this was like, you know, in decades past, like New York's a nightmare to rent. You're only going to get so much and so much square footage for so much and so much of your wallet, your bank account. Then you, then you hear about like Hong Kong, Hong Kong yeah. prices. Oh my God. Well, that's what Vancouver seeming like now price wise. Well, $10,000 $10, a month for a one bedroom downtown. 10,000. Easily. I've seen more. There, I've seen uh, some, uh, what do you call it, Airbnbs, up to $30,000 for a month. What the fuck? Yeah, we're talking like that's like exclusive penthouse type of thing, right? Yeah. No, like that's, that's fucking If crazy. you got it, you got it, and you'll pay for that. You know what I mean? I can't even imagine that, but I try to get my head around it, but that's wild, man. Wow. Yeah. I'm not wow. exaggerating, too. I literally... Recently, I was just, look, I was curious about the prices of an Airbnb or whatever for, like, a whole house or for, like, a whole suite. Yeah. I, did, I saw some that were around the $30,000 a month mark. That's crazy, right? 30000 Yeah. That's more than I pay for rent in a year. Wow. Well, man, it's like, couldn't you, like, buy it? I don't drive or own a car or anything. Couldn't you buy a car for that price? Yeah, you could. Probably Maybe could, not, right? not a, a great brand new car, but like, yeah, you know, I have no idea how what the price yeah. of cars is now, man. You have to buy like a pretty decent used car for thirty thousand dollars. Oh, you better you better be able to buy a decent used car for thirty thousand dollars, man. You think right? Like that's fucking insane, man. Think about the places in the world you could see for thirty thousand dollars. You could go some places, man. Yeah. You could go some places. You know, I don't know how far that would get you in Canada, being you know, with our interprovincial airline fees, but you yeah, could go some other places. 
that's actually that's another question too actually which is kind of unrelated but related in that top sense of the topic it's like touring canada like as as an artist who's you know been an active canadian artist for so many years do you find it harder more difficult to tour in your own country than other places due to how expensive it is to travel within your country well first off two things i've never paid to travel for my tours that should be well that's covered the promoters to pay yeah. for it but i mean yeah, like I'm, but yeah I, I feel what you're saying no i don't even do canada at all anymore yeah so, i mean i don't really even tour anymore you know what i mean like i, I know i'm gonna get back to it but when the covid thing hit it seemed like a good time for me to like recalibrate and let me have some studio time some me time and then since that's lifted I just haven't felt like going back on the road, man. I had so much of that for so very, very long. And for me to do successful shows, I have to go to the U.S. I can't go to Canada. It's not going to work. I have to go to overseas. I have to be in Europe and the U.K. and stuff. That's where you can see a mocha show, and it's going to be well attended, if not sold out. <laughs> or at least well attended, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if I can go to like do a Windsor or whatever. I feel like I have three options for Canada. It's like Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, and Victoria. So that's the like four options. But Excellent. the tides are turning, my friend. I swear. Mark my words. I think the tides are turning and the time's going to come again because I'm seeing little hip hop shows being put on and being sold out like everywhere. Yeah. And by like, you know, not mainstream artists man so yep. i just did two appearances on stage at at two consecutive souls and mischief shows here in vancouver those were both well sold out early and then i took part in the hip-hop is 50 celebration with prevail we performed together that thing was sold out and it was just us little local artists us rascals junk um <laughs> Uh, amongst others and that was sold out so i was like you know what i think the tides are turning and i really believe two things i f feel like the public in general wants to come back out again and see and feel and experience live entertainment uh and for two i think a lot of these people that maybe grew up with my music or the rascals music they might have gone away, you know, they were our age and they've gone away. They have had families or been busy with business and work and have gotten to a place in their life and their age where they feel like, oh, I miss music. I want to get back and see what's going on. So I think it's I think it's a combination of, of those two things. And plus, you know, that COVID did a number on on all of us, man. It really, truly did. Yeah. Yeah. And not even counting like people we've known that have succumbed to it mortally you know yeah and i i can actually say this as well that i i feel like hip-hop shows at least in ontario were in a very dead space prior to covid like i can recall doing shows you know that they should have had much greater attendance than they than they had many of them like and we're talking whether it was like um, like even the show that we did together in Guelph, I, I, I remember that I was, you know, surprised that it wasn't better sold. Um, the same with um, doing a Socrates show here in Toronto, Socrates in Toronto. And I'm like, really? Like, how is there not more people here? Um, yeah, one of the kings of Toronto. That's wild, better, right? Like, right? Like, same thing with Vancouver. There was no shows happening, like hardly any, man. And like our scene as we knew it, is no more yeah but now i'm feeling like you know there's a possibility this thing could re really reignite yeah but we have to be we have to be invested in it as artists just as much as we expect the fans to be we gotta mm -hmm. love it again we gotta love it and we gotta give our all and really give an entertaining show it's like q-tip yeah. once said I mean, you really got to rap and be all that, but prepare yourself for the breaks. Check it out. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, yeah, I feel like there's a second coming, man. I really think it's, but it's up to all of us. And 
the visibility that this 50 years of hip hop has given us all it's like a good glimmer of hope man i'm i'm seeing a lot of a lot of people riding off of this uh hip hop is 50 thing and and succeeding and potentially gaining new ears and reigniting the love in older fans too yeah and i think in that thing too right you you, as as much as the internet you know has changed the way that you know younger generations perceive this thing that we call hip-hop and the culture and, and everything else that the other thing that it does do is it gives younger people access to what came before as to where like when i was coming up unless you knew somebody who was older than you or you went to a record shop and just bought some shit that was old because it looked cool my introduction to early stuff aside from those avenues was typically if uh mtv or a radio station did an old school day or like you know one of the earliest things i remember is when mtv did um like a month mtv2 did a month or two month long special every saturday where they basically remembered Yo! MTV raps. And they would talk about different eras of Yo! MTV raps every Saturday for like two hours and play videos that that were, you know, special in those, you know, whether it be 87, 88, 89. And they kind of like went over each of the years the show was present and kind of the importance and the impact of that show in that year and played videos from it. And that's how I learned a lot of early hip hop when I was like 13. I was like, oh, you know, and this is shit that nobody else knew anywhere around where yeah. I came. They weren't watching this and this was not accessible to you. But with the internet, if you're interested, you can find it, right? So I think we're going to start to see more surgeons of people, maybe maybe younger people as well too, who are interested in this history, especially with this Hip Hop 50 thing and, you know, being able to have that access to it, I think. No, um, but there's there's other undue credit that needs to be given. Yeah. To like yourself and the concept of like these blog like video shows and interviews, the proliferation of that nowadays, man, for somebody that's interested in like is a hip hop historian like myself or anybody else like these shows are so invaluable the gems and jewels that our heroes are dropping on these shows you know what I'm saying like or or like you know like qualies people's party or, or you name it um that um what's his head baker that runs the show out of california i love soren baker uh unique yeah. Access. yeah yeah unique access big face Gary, like no matter what, what the production value is of it, all yep. of these things are so invaluable, man. And I know they are drawing new ears and younger ears as well as reigniting that love in the older fans. You know, they yep. might be cruising around like they maybe some, they listened to something from the nineties in hip hop on their YouTube on YouTube recently. And all of a sudden they're directed to, Oh, what Moni love has a, interview and a performance like i need to know you know like oh shout out to moni love by the way you know inexplicably i've been listening to her first album for like a week straight i used to have it when it came out in 1990 and i always thought it was a good album and the jungle brothers were involved with that beat nuts had a production on there as well that was their first one. Oh, um, really? yeah they did the song pups lick and bone on moni moni love's first album but it's just she was such a dope and inventive MC. Like she really is good, man. I, it, the album's called Down to Earth, and you know there's a couple like houseish tracks on there, but there's a lot of like raw hip hop stuff, good storytelling, and she actually had her own like her own like vocal stylings that nobody else was doing at the time. Maybe it had something to do with her being British. I, I don't know, man, but or like you know, like London born. But, um, man, I've been listening to the hell out of that stuff. You know what I'm saying? I guess that relates to what we're talking about with, like, interview shows and all that. But that's I, – I believe that's one of the key ingredients to, uh, you know, this – this uh, a, a new round of hip-hop nostalgia and just the essence of what we know as – quote unquote real hip hop being blasted out there. I mean yeah. 
drink drink champs. Like the the list goes on. There there's there's so much, man. It doesn't have to be a high production value, but the value and the spirit has to be in there in order for people to want to be interested. You know what I'm saying? Yep, exactly. And I and I agree very much. I I could care less about the production value. Like a lot of times I'll listen to this stuff on YouTube with my headphones in. I won't even be looking at the screen. My my phone will be down on charging on the desk and I just got Yeah, my and good point. Like why do we have to be looking at them? We ain't gotta yep. be looking at them. Yep. You as know long what I'm saying? As long as it's legible to I can hear and understand the context of the conversation, that's all that matters to me. Give it to me in audio form. I don't care. That's what how pick. I'm saying. Like the rap album. That's why I'm like nowadays, I'm like, why would I don't even need to, I don't want to put my old ass face on the cover of an album. I don't also need to be I don't want to be in the video like doing a lip sync of my own stuff. Rather, let me just just give me the camera. Let me go shoot some things that look cool to me. That's yeah. that's my feeling on it. I'll still put my face here and there, but I'm not relying on it anymore. You know, back when I was young and pretty and vain, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like, and I thought that was like such a part of it. You yeah. know, like I have to show my face. You got to show your face, you know, MF doom had a good thing going on early. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that thing, right. And it's funny you say that. Cause I even myself, for many years, like I used to get pissed off if I would watch an artist's music video and they didn't make an appearance in the video. I'd almost feel like I was me cheating. too. I, was, I, used to, I, I used to literally felt, felt like I was cheated. I'm like, yeah. what? You're not going to be in the video? I can't think of any like certain uh, examples right off the bat, but it did happen. Fuck Temptations because they shot it or, when he was. Oh, okay. Tupac Temptations. He has like there's there's um everyone's in it. Jada Pinkett, Tretch, Coolio. Well, what um, about I don't remember did so many tears come out after he passed? I don't remember now. No, nope. tears was when he's that's me against the world. So he would have been in prison still for that too. I think that's well, another one. Hearing, yeah. That's like one of my favorite Tupac songs. And also because Shock G did such a beautiful job on the beat, and I'm like the one of the biggest shock G fans ever known to man. Oh, really? Oh, dude, that's where I get part of my production panache from. I, I guess I don't credit him enough. I really ought to, man. On, on my last album I put out, the uh, what was it called? The, my last, the one that came out in June recent. Oh, it was called In and of Itself. I actually dedicated it to Shock G and borrowed like what I thought was like little nods to his production because. I actually made the album in 2021, right after he passed. So it was on my mind. And I'm like, man, Shock was a lot more influential to me than I, I, I guess I've than I've been willing to admit. Not even willing to admit. It's just, it was all, I felt he was always overshadowed by like my um, adoration of Q Tip, you know, or Pete Rock or whatever. But the Shock G that shock g like left such a huge imprint imprint on me. was incredible too like even like you look at the early tupac stuff like it was very very um um kind of like very early dj premier production where it was like it wasn't it was almost like it was like mixed but never mastered you know what i mean it's like very very rough quiet uh, even like you know, um, BDP, like all means necessary, like very, sure. or or um, great example, EPMD's first three albums. You yes, know, you know, or they- just digital underground itself. There's a lot of digital stuff sounded kind of had that sort of vibe. You look yeah. at digital. Uh, my favorite digital underground album is Body Hat Syndrome. I yeah. love that album to pieces. I listen to that album almost every day. Pretty yeah, crazy man. So I know I know where you're coming from. I mean, and, you know, Tupac is from Digital Underground, right? So, and like at the production though, it's like it's very like quiet. And no matter on the best stereo system, you almost can never turn it up loud enough to really crank the way you want it to. But the production in itself is incredible on those albums. Tupacalypse Now, like that, the beat for Tap will forever be one of my favorite beats. When my home shock, shock, shock did some real great stuff for Saphir too. 
Yeah. Oh, really? See, I never really dug too deep into Saphir. So actually, now that I know that, I, I'll I'll go do a little bit of digging afterwards. Well, fair enough. Saphir didn't really leave us with a huge body of work, but you know what? Saphir was also in Digital Underground at the same time as Tupac. Oh. So the Body Hat Syndrome album, Saphir is on damn near almost every song. Really? He was a member of Digital Underground during 1993. Crazy, right? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like Pac, Pac was Pac was on his way out and already established himself as a solo artist. So he's only on one song on the album, but Saphir is all over that album. Wow. Trippy, it's, right? Yeah, that's really trippy, actually. I would never would have even realized that. That's uh Yeah, man. That's that's really cool. I'm gonna have to go check that album out now. In my own, you know, hip hop journey, it was an overlooked thing too. I got so much other stuff in nineteen ninety three. I was allowing to overshadow the digital stuff. You know what I mean? Digital put that album out in, I believe, November 93. But you know what else came out in November 93? It was Midnight Marauders. Yeah. You know, and what else had just come out? Like, you know, uh, um, De La Soul, Balloon, Mind State, Black Moon, Enter the Stage, Dell the Funky, Homo Sapien, No Need for Alarm, Souls of Mischief, 93 Till Infinity. Like, there's a lot of stuff that come out. And, I don't know. Somehow that digital underground album, just like you know, I remember seeing the signal, the sim, the single with um, uh, and it was a Humpty song too. It was a, uh, I might have a brain fart. I ain't had dinner yet. That probably has something to do with it. <laughs> Blood sugar is low, but um, anyway, yeah, that one just it went by, and I didn't, yo, I didn't. Decades later, you know, what I'm saying it was around the. I had the tape. For the longest time and i don't know why i never listened to it and then when i found out shock g had passed for some reason i was like i just went right back i went back to that album and studied it and since shock's passing it has remained in my weekly rotation like hi it's yeah. an amazing album it's unlike any other digital underground album there is but i guess you could say that with every digital underground album because yeah. Sometimes there's such vast departures. This was like body hat syndrome was like crunchy. There was more jazz on it. It was less like parliament and more like, I don't know. Shock had a wild mind. Cause yeah. you know, the next album after that was future rhythm, which literally sounded like a taste of the absolute, like the two thousands. And that was 1996, man. So the guy was a visionary, man. Yeah. Absolutely. He Really, I don't think actually gets the credit he deserves for how influential him and Digital Underground as a whole really were on hip hop as a whole. Like the things that came, like even Saphir being a part of them, but like Tupac, it's like a true shame, man. Even his passing didn't seem to raise his status much more than like a few months. I mean, I, I know yeah. that. Money B and Young Hump are trying their darndest to like preserve and continue the legacy of Digital Underground, but it's a true shame in in the in the context of historical hip hop figures that are, you know, so so they should be so loved on on, on such a bigger bigger level. Um, shock needs to be up there, man. Especially yeah. being, even him being responsible for giving us Tupac. Exactly. Like that alone. It's like, you know, it, like, you know, people like Lil Wayne get revered for, you know, introducing the world to Drake and Nicki Minaj and things like that. And yes, yes, these guys are so mainstream that. OK, but it's like, you, you know, Q-Tip gets revered to a degree for really introducing the world to Dilla, even though Dilla was doing his own thing. It You know, he's the one who kind of really is like you know well yeah where would where would dilla have it might have been years and years if it hadn't been for him meeting q-tip right yeah and like you know eminem gets dre dre gets the credit for eminem like you know eminem gets the credit for 50 cent you you get this but for some reason people don't give shock that credit where he truly deserves it for giving Pac that hey i got a wild card i got a wild card for you what would have happened like, if it hadn't been for Bobito? Would we have Doom? 
Mm. You know, he was out of the game. And it, but, you know, he was still around the CM mob, constipated monkeys. And, and you know, Bob Beto was kind of in that fold, right? And um, Bob Beto put out his, you know, his comeback shit, right? Like gas draws and all, like those early shits, right? Really? That was all through Bob, Bob Beto did all that? To my knowledge, that's Bob Beto came out on his his little label. No way. Eh? Um, yeah, Fondalum, Fondalum Records. That's what it was. No kidding. Wow. Yeah. Somebody what? had to believe in 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 Doom at that point. You know, it'd been so many years since KMD and you know, his brother had died and, and Sub Rock had died in ninety three, you know what I mean? And I he went through a long dark period and uh somebody had to believe in him and, and give him a platform and that person was Bobito, to my to my knowledge. And then for that to unfold and really, you know, now Doom is once is regarded one well, of the not even just for doom but i i almost want to i almost feel like bobito had a good hand in cool keith's transformation into a modern madman throughout the 90s too right yeah 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 you know i mean obviously there's you know the um you know cut master kurt and stuff that's my man like all the respect to Kurt. Kurt needs more, more props for his production involvement too. But yeah. I'm saying like, Cool Keith was always up on the Bob Pito show, and and that's who would spin his early funky ass records and stuff. So I don't know, you know, Bob Pito is like a bigger tastemaker than the people remember. <laughs> He gets credit for it. And even like to talk, like just stretching about Beto. I mean, obviously, I assume you've seen the documentary. I, 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 I loved you. it. I loved yeah. it. I was so happy to see that happen, man. Yeah. That was beautiful. But even like you take it from there and it's like you look at so many different avenues of hip hop that really came through them. And a documentary covers a lot of it, right? Like, even yeah. like Jay Z with Big L, you know what I mean? And that famous freestyle, like that stretching Bob, Eminem going Those through. Those are mischief. Souls of mischief, yeah. Bad and, Joe. Uh, but like you even look at like how how far those tentacles reach, like in the underground. Like if you look like Necro, Ill Bill, nonfiction, these guys, they started up at Stretch and Bob. Like Yeah, got, but you, I mean, you know, I think then like Search probably brought them up there, right? Yeah, Search brought them up, yeah. 100%. Every anyway, the needless to say, like this it relates back to like what we were saying about shock, but everybody's got a springboard. Everybody's got somebody that believed in them enough to give them that initial major boost, man. You know, there's just like, there's 8 million stories, man. This yeah. hip hop thing is so rich. This thing is so rich that you and I could probably keep this call going for 48 hours and still have barely scratched many surfaces. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 100%. And actually, with that being said, I want to actually ask you a question on that topic. If you had, if you had to credit somebody, who would be the springboard for Mocha only? Mm. Oh, I already kind of went on to that. That'd be Rennie Foster. Yeah, Rennie Foster. Yeah. Yeah. Juice Dub. Dub Nut. Yeah. He was the first guy, like, even though he's you know, only like a year or two older than me, but he had some clout and influence in the community at that time in Victoria through his being in the first rap group and also being a notable graffiti writer and skateboarder. And he was like the guy that everybody wanted to be around. Like he was super cool and good at everything he did. So Rennie Foster is kind of like my springboard. And as far as when it came to me and Prevail getting together, I have to give it up to uh, this cat, Judd Skinner. He was actually born in Singapore, so it's interesting that his name is Judd Skinner, but he was our first producer who's like who who had enough faith in us that it's like, I want to do your beats and let me manage you and try to get you out as a duo, as split sphere. I only recently found out two years after that that, that Judd passed. He he had a sudden death. Um I only found this out mere weeks ago. Uh it's hard to believe because Judd was Judd had in his possession me and Prevail's 
EP, our first EP, our first oh. and only EP is Split Spear. We never ended up putting it out. Just became overshadowed by other stuff. We went on, you know, we lost touch with Judd. I got in touch with him uh, about, you know, a couple of years ago, trying to get that original demo slash EP back. He's like, yeah, my mom's got it. All right. Well, yeah, well, I'll make sure I get it. I'll make sure I get it. Then I hadn't talked to Judd in a while. I'm like, man, why can I not get a hold of this guy? Can't reach him through social. Can't reach him through email. What's going on? I was with my boy Stace Prince. And uh, this was mere weeks ago. And um, he's like, man, I can't get a hold of Judd either. He's like, and he's, he said something to the effect. He's like, man, what if he died or something? I'm like, nah, man, don't joke about that. He's like, well, I don't know. And just out of curiosity, we pulled up on his phone. The uh, You just put Google his name or whatever. And an obituary came up right off the bat. We were, you know. And we were having a good like kick it session. We were out, we had ice cream, we was at the park talking hip hop and stuff. We was quiet. That was the end of that kick it session, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. Judd was the second guy that really was my springboard, my my booster rocket, if you will, you know what I mean? There and there there's more. Um, Mad Child. You know, after the split sphere thing, you know, like we we in 1995, we had linked up with Mad Child and sort of touted this idea of doing this, what we called at the time, super group, which is laughable because it's not like any of us really had big names in 1995, right? It would be me, Mad Child, Prevail, and DJ Kilo C from Vancouver, veteran, historic hip-hop DJ who's still going and like one of the greatest DJs of all time as far as like, his ability to cut, scratch, and mix. Anyway, we were going to do this like super group idea or whatever. <laughs> we call it a super group. Um, and, you know, that I, I ended up after doing a few recordings, it just felt like it would be better if it was just mad and prevail. You know what I mean? I, I don't know what, it, what I had, why I felt that, but we continued to be a crew. But Mad Child believed enough in me uh financially too and like to include me in the you know his unfolding his uh battle axe records label so we've all got those people man and he was like the third major person that like you know i, I gotta credit myself too because i was already putting out underground tapes on my own and making my own buzz and traveling all over going to california and all that and like selling these things on the street like you know what I'm saying so that had something to do with it but we all yeah. need a springboard and mad child is one of those people that I, I should probably give more credit to as far as you know i'm not just a swallow member stuff but me as a solo entity in the 90s he had something to do with it for sure and like even with mad actually so do you do you still talk to Matt at all actually yeah i once in a blue moon but it's yeah. like you know people drift apart or whatever yeah. I got nothing but the utmost respect and love for the guy for sure. Yeah. Um, but I, but prevail is somebody I, I, I've just stayed closer with and I see prevail like often enough, you know what I mean? Well, so, you like childhood friends. So, I mean, that kind of makes sense. Like, yeah, absolutely. He prevail was like, you know, an extra brother to me. You know what I mean? I, I grew up with, I have a little brother, but prevail was like an additional, like even younger brother, you know? Yeah. Um, and, recently we've been talking about actually finally putting out some split sphere stuff so hey. it's possible man anything's possible i told him i was like yo before we leave this marble man let's make sure that we we, we put some split sphere stuff out he's like yeah agreed let's do it yeah um, i mean oh you know, i know you both you guys both get caught up and busy and i mean you work like a madman you put projects out like, like well, no it, it seems like i do but i don't really it's not yeah. like I did before. You know, before I, I, I was happy and, like, bragging about putting out, like, four projects a year. But besides Martian Christmas, which is kind of like autopilot, it's not really, like, a, what I consider, like, the annual Mocha album. But there's not even an annual Mocha album. And there hasn't been for a while. You yeah. know? It Can Do came out in 2020. Yeah. And in and of itself came out in 2023. This is three years between that. You know what I mean? So 
I slowed things down. Part of it was consciously and part of it was like, maybe I felt like I exhausted myself and put out so much stuff. What left is there to say? Well, mm -hmm. as sure enough as I'm here talking to you right now, speaking and talking and using my imagination and my memory and my, my brain and my love for hip hop, there's certainly enough to continue to say and do. 100%. So I, uh, that's and earlier in our conversation i was saying like yeah i feel like i'm doing much more collaborative stuff doing more commissions like pay commissions for other artists and all that and i want to do more and more so now i'm sitting on like i'm between the like the three or four projects i'm doing on other people's production with other producers and solo stuff and i i'm working on the next album for next spring and it's called arbutus canyon which is based on a real place on Vancouver Island. It's like, that's a real place called Arbutus Canyon. And I always wanted to use the term Arbutus. Arbutus is a tree that's prolific here on the West Coast. It's a red bark tree. It's just something special that West Coasters can really relate to. So I'm working yep. on that. I've got Halloween instrumental album coming out October 1st, or at least early that's October. It's called Spooky Beats and Other Treats. That'll be coming out through UrbNet Records. And it's not like the wandering, meandering type of instrumental album that I've shown in the past. This is actually like raw beats, like you could rap to it. And it's a lot darker. And I kind of bit my boy Cutmaster Kurt on it, on like his latest, his like ni late 90s steez, like the stuff he did with Cool Keith. So it's kind of more along the lines of that. Daryl from Urbnet was asking me at the top of August if I had anything I might consider um submitting for a halloween themed compilation album so i told him i'll do you one better why don't i just do a whole instrumental project he's like all right let's go for it so i uh, went through all, all like you know archives and chose my beats that like some things i make are not something i would rap on they're like i use my imagination it might be something darker that somebody else might want to rap on you know what i mean or saved for like an album that I wanted to be dark. <clears throat> anyway, so that's what this uh, Spooky Beats and Other Treats is going to be like. It's like raw, two or three minute long. None of those short mocha teaser, I hate you mocha beats for 30 seconds that you hear as an interlude. This is like nasty, dirty, like you'll picture Cool Keith rapping to it and stuff. Because like I said, I straight up bit Keith, uh, Kurt. I told Kurt. I was like, look, I'm going to bite your style for some tank dog stuff. He's like, ha ha, go ahead. And I literally like kind of like use like his template, you know what I'm saying? He laughed about it, but I really did it. So, you know, <laughs> for, awesome. I, I'm sitting on like two tank God albums that I've done on this type of production that have yet to come out. I've got a lot of stuff coming out. I've got a Fender Rhodes based instrumental album coming out called Rhodes Traveled. So probably in the new year for that. So I got a lot of stuff coming up. And, and this is a perfect time to say that because I'm, I'm going to have to breeze. I, I need to eat. And we needed to get to a, a, peer, uh, an, a part in the conversation where I have to. I'd be remiss if I didn't inform yep. our yep. listening public about what I'm currently working on. You know, I'm not really yep. retired. I'm just partially retired. <laughs> well, it sounds even, like that's gonna, even that's going to change. I am now accepting show bookings. So for anybody here in this, you want a mocha show, I will come and rip the fuck out of your venue. I will tear that shit down. Anybody who's been to one of my shows can attest to that. I, will, I put my 100% in, and I will make it an entertaining show, no matter how big or small the audience is. I can I attest to I'll do That's what I can. I do what I can. He's either gonna fly or it's not, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I'll be there. I'll be there. You wanna book Mocha, you hit me up. Hit DM me on any of the socials or email my man RC at mocha only B I Z Mocha Only Biz at gmail.com. RC will take care of you. All right. Well, Mocha, my man. Thank you very, very much, man. And, and um, you know, I'd love to have you back again to chop it up. And it's actually I would love to. Let's try to make this a more regular thing, man. Cause I, I enjoy speaking with you. Um I feel like this this has been our best. This is like hands down. Hands down. Yeah. And like and, and 
and just talking hip hop, you know, we didn't even scratch this. Uh, I guess you can't see it because of the blur, but we didn't okay. even scratch it. We talked about Yeah, like, you maybe... probably had questions for me, oh, and I really yeah, threw you yeah. for a loop. No, but do you know what's perfect, actually? Because I don't even think I mentioned this prior, but I, this interview is the fifth official episode for a new program I'm starting through Breaking Records Radio called Rap Nerds. So our conversation today couldn't have gone any better. You know, gotcha. that's literally... Hey, I am a self-admitted rap nerd. I, I am a nerd. I mean, you know, I, like, so. you know, I have a street a street element to me. Like, you know, so I, I don't know what, what's up, but um, I'm a nerd, man. Like, and, you know, a nerd is a badge you wear with pride that yep. it's, you take a great, great interest in whatever you are interested in. That is a nerd. Yep. A geek is a whole different thing. I am not a yep. geek. Yeah, but I wear that nerd shit to the end. Same here, my man. And I think any of us, I think any of us rap nerds proudly will wear that title too, right? So it's yeah, uh, man. That's like word burglars like that too. He's one of the biggest rap nerds ever, man. I have a conversation had, with with him, and like it's, it's just like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'd interview him myself, actually. One of my co-host interviewed him a, a couple years ago and it was a great interview but i feel like me and him would probably have a pretty good conversation yeah i mean this you know the person being interviewed just to, has to be in the headspace where they're they're open and not trying to be mr cool guy you know what i mean that's what it comes down to we were talking about that earlier in this man i, I just no longer have any desire to put up any sort of pretense or i'm so cool like let me let me let's get into it and really talk about the love that we have for this thing. Yep. Yeah. And that right there is the perfect note to end it on, man. Literally. Absolutely. My man Mocha, thank you very much for your time. Um, enjoy whatever dinner you end up getting up to. Hey, man. Yo, thank you for your time and thank you for having me on your platform. That means a lot to me. Did you realize, like, you know, us rappers and producers like who appear on these things, you know what I'm saying? And, and you know, as an artist yourself, like this is our only time to really say what we are to yep. really give you, like I can only put so much in the music. I always tell people, I'm like, man, cause I have a very impersonal social media. I only want to put my, my music stuff up there. You don't need to know if I'm taking a shit or what you know what shoes i'm wearing or whatever i i just i'm just private like that but this this these are privileged moments for me yeah, to be given a, plat given a platform this is better than an album you know what i'm saying as well too man to be able to pick someone's brain uh as yours and even just to be able to have the conversations of hip-hop you know like even in that, I enjoy that part equally as much as I do being able to pick your brain about the history, just to have the dialogue about hip hop, to learn that Safir was a part of Digital Underground. You know, like that shit to me, that's the coolest shit in the world. Now, now I got an assignment. Bro, to, go back know? and check that album. You will be tickled, man. It's I'm got good. a bit of everything, man. It's seriously, dude. It's something else. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to taking a listen to it now, and I'll hit yeah. you back. To Oh, All right, cool, good. cool, cool. Well, my man Mocha, thank you very much, man. And we'll do this again. I'm I'm definitely down to make it a more frequent thing. Bless up. All right, my man. Cheers, brother. Right. Easy.